Week 8 focused on answering the questions, what is the transportation system and how do we measure its sustainability? In your course material and discussions, you explored the answers to these questions related to sustainable transportation. What is a transportation system and what are the major components? How do transportation profiles differ from region to region? What are some advantages and disadvantages to current transportation systems? Which sustainability indicators should we use to evaluate the sustainability of transportation options? How does transportation interact with the, the other main energy uses, electricity and heating? Why is transportation sustainability an important topic? Although this was not one of your required readings, there will be some information from this free online book called The Geography of Transport Systems presented in this video to help tie together some concepts from the Week 8 lesson. If you are interested in learning more about transportation issues, this is a great resource that covers many issues and topics in an interesting and easy to read way. There is a link to the book included in the optional readings for Week 9, or you can go to the website listed here. So what is a transportation system? There are three different environmental media in which the movement of people and goods happens. Air, land, and water. Within these different environmental media, there are different modes of transportation. Airplanes and helicopters for passengers, freight, military, and rescue operations. Boats, ships, and tankers for passengers and freight. And trucks, trains, cars, and other vehicles for passengers, commercial, and government operations, freight, and fuel. Passenger and freight vehicles can generally be classified into light duty, LD, medium duty, MD, and heavy duty, HD. You will be learning about the different sustainability impacts of these different vehicle classes in week 9. There is infrastructure to support all of these different modes of transportation, including airports, roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, fuel stations, railways, pipelines, so storage facilities, ports, and harbors. All of these modes of transportation require fuel, and much of this infrastructure is used to transport fuel from one place to another or store it. 93% of global energy for transportation and about 90% of U.S. energy for transportation comes from petroleum, which includes crude oil and petroleum products. First, these petroleum products, along with natural gas, are extracted from, the under, from under the ground via onshore or offshore drilling. The original fuels that are extracted are then processed in an oil refinery or a processing plant for liquefied or compressed natural gas. All of these transportation modes, infrastructure, and fuel are interconnected through networks to get fuel and vehicles from place to place. It may be helpful to think of a transportation system in terms of its major components. Modes represent conveyances, mostly taking the form of vehicles that are used to move passengers and freight from place to place. Some modes are designed to carry only passengers or freight, while others can carry both. Infrastructures are the physical support or tra of transport, transport modes where routes, like rail cars, canals, or highways, and terminals, like ports or airports, are the most significant components. Networks are a system of linked locations that are used to represent the functional and spatial organization of transportation. They indicate which locations are serviced and how they are serviced. Within a network, some locations are more accessible have more connections than others that have less connections. Flows are the movements of people, freight, fuel, and information over their respective networks. Flows have origins, intermediary locations, and destinations. An intermediary location is often required to go from one origin to a destination. For instance, flying from one airport to another may require a transit at a hub airport. Global transportation road networks are made up of millions of miles of roads connecting cities, towns, and villages throughout the world. This map of the world, which may be different than the way you normally see a world map, notice the United States here and Africa here, shows primary roads throughout the world. The CIA Factbook estimates that there are about 40 million miles of paved and unpaved roads throughout the world. The U.S. transportation system, including infrastructure and equipment, is valued at about $7 trillion and is the largest transportation system in the world in several key respects. 
It has more airports and more miles of road and rail than any other country and is fourth in miles of navigable waterways. The U.S. road network includes about 4.1 million miles of road, which is about 10% of the roads in the entire world. These roads are used by 312 million U.S. residents, 60 million visitors and tourists, and 7.4 million business establishments. The American Society of Civil Engineers gave the United States a D for the state of its roads in their 2013 report card for America's infrastructure. 42% of America's major urban highways are congested, costing the economy an estimated $101 billion in wasted time and fuel annually. This was a slight improvement over the year before, but is expected to decline in the future because the country needs to spend about $80 billion more each year than the $91 billion per year it currently spends to maintain and improve road conditions. Cars, vans, and buses are commonly used to transport people. Trucks, airplanes, and trains are used to move people and freight. Barges and pipelines move freight or bulk quantities of materials. In 2011, there were about 244 million vehicles, cars, motorcycles, buses, and trucks, in the United States, about four for every five people. Light trucks, cars, and motorcycles use about 58% of the total amount of energy consumed for transportation in the United States. Large trucks use about 20%, planes use about 9%, boats and ships about 4%, and trains and buses use about 3%. The military and pipelines each use about 3%. The national average fuel economies for passenger cars and light trucks have improved over time due mainly to federal government fuel economy standards for those types of vehicles. However, total transportation fuel consumption has generally increased due to an increase in the number of vehicles, especially light pickup trucks, sport utility vehicles, and heavy duty freight trucks, and in the number of miles traveled per vehicle. The American Society of Civil Engineers gave the United States a C plus for bridges in their 2013 report card, noting that in, about, in total about 10% of the nation's bridges are rated as structurally deficient. While the average age of the nation's roughly 600,000 bridges is currently 42 years. To improve this, the government needs to invest $8 billion annually in addition to the $13 billion it already spends on bridge maintenance and repair. You can see here on this map that Maine has one of the highest percentages of deficient bridges in the country. This map shows the global rail network. There are more than 400,000 miles of rail throughout the world, most, most of which are in the United States. The U.S. has nearly 139,000 miles of railroad lines, about 34% of the world total. Railroads are experiencing a competitive resurgence as both an energy efficient freight transportation option and a viable city to city passenger service. In 2012, Amtrak recorded its highest year of ridership with about 31 million passengers, almost doubling ridership since 2000, with growth anticipated to continue. Both freight and passenger rail have been investing heavily in their tracks, bridges, and tunnels, as well as adding new capacity for freight and passengers. In 2010 alone, freight railroads renewed the rails on more than 3,100 miles of railroad track, equivalent to going coast to coast. Since 2009, capital investment from both freight and passenger railroads has exceeded $75 billion, actually increasing investment during the recession when material prices were lower and trains ran, ran less frequently. With high ridership and greater investment in this system, the grade for rail saw the largest improvement in the American Society of Civil Engineers report card for transportation infrastructure, moving up to a C plus in 2013. Transit services include transit bus, commuter, subway, elevated and light rail trains, and other kinds of public transit such as ferry boats. There are more than 730 urban transit agencies and nearly 1,600 rural and tribal government transit agencies in the United States. The American Society of Civil Engineers gave transit a grade of D in 2013 as transit agencies struggled to balance increasing ridership with declining funding. America's public transit infrastructure plays a vital role in our economy 
connecting millions of people with jobs, medical facilities, schools, shopping, and recreation, and is critical to the one-third of Americans who do not drive cars. Unlike many U.S. infrastructure systems, the transit system is not comprehensive, as 45% of American households lack any access to transit, and millions more have inadequate service levels. Americans who do, do have access have increased their ridership 9.1% in the past decade, and that trend is expected to continue. Although investment in transit has only increased, deficient and deteriorating transit systems cost the U.S. economy $90 billion in 2010, as many transit agencies are struggling to maintain aging and obsolete fleets and facilities amid an economic downturn that has reduced their funding, forcing service cuts and fare increases. The U.S. has about 2.6 million miles of oil and gas pipelines throughout the country, including more than 1.2 million miles of natural gas pipelines. These pipelines are graded in the American Society of Civil Engineers report card under the energy category, which received a D plus in 2013. So many improvements are needed to these pipeline networks. There are around 1.4 million miles of navigable waterways throughout the world, much of which is in and around the United States. Many of these waterways are used to transport oil from point of exploration to refining and processing facilities around the world. Choke points are narrow channels along widely used global sea routes, some so narrow that restrictions are placed on the size of the vessel that can navigate through them. World oil choke points for maritime transit of oil are a critical part of global energy security. In 2011, total world oil production amounted to approximately 87 million barrels per day, and over one half was moved by tankers on fixed maritime routes. By volume of oil transit, the Strait of Hormuz leading out of the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Malacca linking the Indian and Pacific Oceans are two of the world's most strategic choke points. The international energy market is dependent upon reliable transport. The blockage of a choke point, even temporarily, can lead to substantial increases in total energy costs. In addition, choke points leave oil tankers vulnerable to theft from pirates, terrorist attacks, and political unrest in the forms of war or hostilities, as well as shipping accidents that can lead to disastrous oil spills. The CIA Factbook reports that a total of 439 ships worldwide were attacked by pirates in 2011, including hijacking 45 ships, capturing 802 seafarers, and killing 8. The Horn of Africa remains the most dangerous area for maritime shipping, accounting for more than 50% of all attacks in 2011 and 70 attacks in 2012. Most of this oil is produced in three main geographic areas, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the U.S., and consumed in two main areas, China and the United States, with most of the proved reserves being located in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. The United States has over 25,000 miles of navigable waterways for commercial shipping and 8,000 commercial waterway and lock facilities. The locations of the top 25 container ports in 2008 are shown here. The U.S. received a grade of C for ports in the American Society of Civil Engineers 2013 report card. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers estimates that more than 95% by volume of overseas trade produced or consumed by the United States moves through our ports. To sustain and serve a growing economy and compete internationally, our nation's ports need to be maintained, modernized, and expanded. While port authorities and their private sector partners have planned over $46 billion in capital improvements from now until 2016, federal funding has declined for navigable waterways and landside freight connections needed to move mo goods to and from the ports. There are about 42,000 airports around the world. The great majority, about 75% of air traffic flows, including 1.4 billion passengers, occurs within three regions, about 36% in North America, 23% in Europe, and 16% in Asia. The most important intercontinental routes link the most economically active regions of the world. The main international routes are the North Atlantic route, which represents the most intensively used air route in the world and accounts for 12% of international traffic, 
the intra-Europe, which handles about 9% of international traffic, the Trans-Pacific route, which accounts for about 14% of global traffic, and the Intra-Asia route, which accounts for about 9% of global traffic, a share which will grow during the next decades. For instance, domestic air services in China represent an enormous potential market with the emergence of regional airline companies. The United States has more airports than any other nation, with more than 5,000 public-use airports and over 14,000 small airports and landing fields that are used primarily in general aviation. Despite the effects of the recent recession, commercial flights were about 33 million higher in number in 2011 than in 2000, stretching the system's ability to meet the needs of the nation's economy. The Federal Aviation Administration estimates that the national cost of airport congestion and delays was almost $22 billion in 2010, 12. If current federal funding levels are maintained, the FAA anticipates that the cost of congestion and delays to the economy will rise from $34 billion in 2020 to $63 billion by 2040. This resulted in a grade of D for aviation on the American Society of Civil Engineers 2013 report card. For the second question in week 8, you reviewed the interactive maps and diagrams from week 4, with an eye on transportation this time, and not just primary energy or electricity. The previous slides have covered many similarities and differences between the United States and the world. Maine is similar to the United States and the world in that it relies mainly on petroleum for its transportation energy. However, it does not produce any of the petroleum or petroleum products it uses, so it is completely reliant on imports for its transportation energy. These resources provided some information about the third question regarding the advantages and disadvantages of current transportation systems, including in the United States, the world, and other regions. Many of these advantages and disadvantages have already been highlighted in the previous discussion on the state of current transportation systems, and others will be covered in the discussion of sustainability indicators. Many of the same sustainability indicators that we considered for electricity can also be applied to transportation, with the exception of capacity factor. And there are definitely more energy security issues associated with transportation than electricity. Chapter 5 of the Transportation Statistics Annual Report discussed some of these sustainability metrics more specifically. Beginning with the costs of annual delays associated with congestion that impacts system reliability. These costs have been estimated to be up to $110 billion in recent years. The report shows where the major congestion zones are located throughout the country. Not surprisingly, much of the congestion is centered around New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and other major cities. The report also shows annual deaths by transportation mode, which have been decreasing recently which may be due in part to less vehicle miles traveled, but also possibly to seatbelt and other safety laws. There is a detailed table showing the distribution of deaths in 2011 by type, with passenger car and light truck occupants and motorcyclists comprising about 75% of all fatalities in that year. About 9% of the highway fatalities in 2011 involved drivers who were distracted by such activities as using a cell phone, texting, eating or drinking, using navigation systems or a map, or grooming themselves. Several states have since enacted laws to ban or limit mobile devices while driving. The Department of Transportation report also includes a table showing greenhouse gas emissions by mode and year with passenger vehicles and trucks comprising about 60% of all greenhouse gas emissions from the sector in 2011. When emissions are normalized by per passenger and distance, the picture changes a bit though, with air travel having the greatest greenhouse gas emissions per passenger per kilometer, followed closely by passenger cars. Although the United States currently produces more oil than it imports and gets most of its imported oil from the Western Hemisphere, mainly Canada, the price of oil is set in a global market and therefore the price we pay is still very much dependent on geopolitical events that happen in the OPEC region and in the Persian Gulf. 
In fact, although gas prices vary significantly around the world, with Europeans paying almost twice as U.S. residents, most of this difference is actually due to government fees and taxes added to a base gasoline price that is pretty similar throughout the world. Because this base price of gasoline is set in a global market tied with the price of crude oil throughout the world. Hopefully this week has given you an appreciation for the importance of improving the sustainability of the transportation system as it is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, incorporates aging and deficient infrastructure, and includes many economic and energy security concerns. Now that you have a solid basis for understanding what a transportation system is and what we need to consider in evaluating its sustainability, we will turn our attention to evaluating the sustainability of conventional transportation options in week nine.